I'm Jordan. And I'm Tyler. And this is the Inside Music City Podcast. Welcome to another episode of Inside Music City, where it's our job to talk to music industry professionals about the ins and outs of the music business. This episode is brought to you by our wonderful patrons. Yay! Thanks, guys. You can learn more about becoming part of the Patreon family, as well as finding a lot of behind-the-scenes content by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash Inside Music City. Today's episode is with Chris Lyle. Chris is the owner of Chris Lyle Lighting Design. He is a Nashville native with over 25 years of experience in the entertainment industry. He's worked as a production designer, lighting designer, tour manager, and show producer for many artists. Some of Chris's present and past clients include Miranda Lambert, One Republic, Billy Currington, Nick Carter, Chris Young, Lee Bryce, Sarah Evans, Keith Urban, and many others. Chris has also taught as an adjunct instructor at Belmont University, teaching classes on production design and tour slash production management. When we recorded this episode, I was just coming off of the cold, and so I might sound a little bit different than normal, and there might be a few stray coughs in there that pass through editing. We learned a lot about Chris and about lighting design and production design, as well as some of the other projects and businesses that he has. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for letting us come into your home and, and get to chat with you today. Uh, thank you, and thanks for having me on the show, and thanks for coming to my home. I know this is a little unor- unorthodox, but I appreciate it. That's for sure. sure. Yeah, we, we really do appreciate it. Um, so tell us a little bit about, about yourself and uh, what you do and how you work in the music business. Sure. Uh, I am a, uh, I'm a fourth generation Nashvilleian. I'm very proud of that fact. You won't meet many of us if I'm not the only one that you'll ever meet. But uh, I love that fact. Um, and I share that because I've, I've loved seeing this town grow and I've loved seeing what it's become from a, not only the music industry, but from a cultural hub. I mean, we, we, we have uh, restaurants beyond Cracker Barrel now, which was much different than when I was growing up. And I'm thankful for that. But uh, I'm, I'm the oldest of four kids and I actually grew up um, right here in this area, I grew up in, in, in the area called Creve Hall, which is um, Harding and 65 over here. And um, I, uh, oldest of four, went to school, uh, tried college, went to MTSU, and I lasted a whopping three months. I discovered fraternities and beer, and and felt like studying and classes were probably not going to work well with that. And so I came home, uh, and 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 it just wasn't college wasn't for me. I uh, started working at a place at that time. It's called Steakout. Uh, I don't they don't they don't really exist anymore. But it was basically instead of delivering pizzas, we delivered steak dinners to your house, and uh, and it was you know it was a delivery driver. And um, there were two other delivery drivers there, and um, we got to be friends. And uh, they were both musicians, and uh, one of them was going to be heading out to the West Coast to do some shows and um, um, at some small venues and stuff. And he said, hey, how would you like to come on the road and like be our roadie? Like, uh, I'm like, yeah, what? Uh, sure, I'd be delivering steaks for $4 an hour or whatever we were getting, if that then, because that was in the 1800s. But anyways, <laughs> um, uh, I said, sure. I said, what would you have me do? And he says, well, we're probably going to have you doing the lights. I said, okay. Well, I don't know anything about that, but let's let's do this. I'm ready for an adventure. I'm I'm I'm, I'm 19 years old. I really have no target in life right now. I'm trying to figure things out. Let's go do this. And so we um, we hopped in a converted milk truck and 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 in his car, so two vehicles, and we drove from here to to Bend, Oregon, and we did four shows out in Oregon and Washington State, and then drove home, and and that was over like a two and a half week period. And by the time I got back, I realized that this, whatever this was, not defining this yet, but whatever this was, I loved. It encompassed everything that I already enjoyed about life. It, it encompassed travel. It encompassed creativity, you know, art by creating a light around music. And, and, and it involved music. I was always a music fan. I loved music. I didn't play, but I loved it. So I was like, Lord, this this is the job for me. This is what I want to do. And, and uh it was a journey, but from that was pretty much the start of, of me saying, this is my career. And uh, early on, I did a lot of stuff for free, a lot of stuff for free back in the day. And, um, you know, it just uh, it took 26 years to get to where I am now. And uh, I'd like to think we're still have a tra- trajectory and that we're still heading somewhere. But, uh, you know, it's it's been a, a, an amazing journey so far. Did doing all that stuff for free help make a name for yourself in the industry? 
I'd say it made a name for myself for working cheap. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know what? I, I'll say this. Uh, in 1991, which is the year I'm referring to, there wasn't here in town, there wasn't, um, obviously there was a Belmont, but there wasn't a, a lighting course at Belmont, and the good Lord knows I couldn't afford it to go to Belmont anyways. But and my whole point was there was no education other than digging in, getting your hands dirty. And I, I did a lot of show for free, a lot of shows for free. I did a lot of shows very cheap, um, where my day rate was 20 or $25. But honestly, Looking back now, as much as it stunk at the time, because I was literally working at McDonald's during the week and going and doing gigs on weekends for $25 a show, I now look at it as that was my college. That was my education. Um, I was paying to get an education, so I may not have made what I deserved, but I was learning. And people were being patient with me, and people were mentoring me, and that's worth something, too, in my book. Um, so... You know, the reputation I would like to think that I had then, looking back on that, is is that I was a hard worker and I was eager to learn. Um, you know, with that, I know I made a lot of mistakes, too. And I, uh, not only technical mistakes on how, how a lighting system works or how to create a light show, but just mistakes in the business, how to treat people and how to, um, how to carry yourself. Um, those are huge lessons I had to learn. Attitude and, and the importance of our personality and how that plays into getting us jobs. Uh, was a very big lesson for me. And it took losing jobs um, um, because I've had a temper tantrum or said the wrong thing in front of the wrong person for me to realize that you're not, it's not only how great you are, how good you are at creating a light show, but it's about that. It's about the person. You're selling yourself and you're selling your personality and, and people have got to want to work with you. They got to want to be around you. And, and um, I had to work on me. I had to grow up. I was 19 and I had to grow up. If somebody wants to get into being a light designer, um, <clears throat> would you, since now you see both, both ends of it, sure. one, having grown up just, just grinding and learning the hard way, like in real life and with mentors and actually doing the work. But since you also see the education side, um, which one would you recommend or is it just yeah, which one would you recommend? You know what? That's a great question, and I see what you're asking me, and, and I'm going to answer this two ways. Okay. As a dad of a 10-year-old, I want my son to go to college and get an education in whatever he chooses. Whatever career path is, suits him, wherever his heart takes him, He need, I would love for him to go to school and, and get a degree. Um, that being said, I'm old school enough that I think there's something about good old-fashioned digging in and working hard. And there's a definite a, a, a generational difference now, and I recognize that you guys are... Uh, 20 years my junior and 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 I'm not picking on I don't want to call it your generation but there's just a difference in in work habits between the generations and what I'm seeing now is that a lot of people that have gone to college to learn lighting design are coming out wanting to already be on that A-level tour running lights for Beyonce or Kings of Leon or whoever. They want to be the, the person doing it. Whereas my mindset is, I'm proud of you for finishing college, but now go and start as the low person on the totem pole. Get your hands dirty and get those blisters and those calluses from pulling cable and work those 18 to 20 hour days. Pay your dues and work your way up in the industry. I think everybody needs to do that no matter what that degree says on that piece of paper. I think that's important. Because when I'm hiring and when I put people in place on tour, one of the things we we look at, in addition to personality and how are they going to get along with people on the bus, is what is their work ethic like? Because uh, we've had people in place on tours that were raised in environments where um, they weren't used to manual labor and they try to phone in that side of this job. And there is a lot of manual labor, especially with younger bands as you're coming up. And we just can't do it. You've got to be a team player. If the audio crew needs help uh, getting their console set up, jump over there and help. If they need, you know, it's, it's about, it's all about teamwork in this industry. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. And it's, like you were saying, it's good to get an education, but you also need that experience. Absolutely. You can't just expect to, once you have that education, once you have that degree, to then just automatically, you're, you don't, I'm trying to think of the right word, you don't, you're not um, entitled to that position. You have to Exactly. You're, you're spot on. Here's the other side about digging in and getting your hands dirty. The touring industry... And I can't speak for the other facets of the entertainment industry, but the touring industry is a networking-based industry. We get and, and we give gigs based on who we know. I have never received a gig uh, based on my paper physical resume. 
ever in 26 years have I handed somebody a piece of paper. It has always been, it's always been, hey, Blank is looking for an LD. Oh, Chris Lyle's available, or let's check with him. It's about who you know. So starting out, coming out of college or wherever you start as the low person on the totem pole, you're starting to build what I call your networking tree. And that tree is important because over your career, uh, one contact, one branch will start to create other branches, which become leaves. And this all becomes one big tree. And um, it's actually, I went back and documented this a few years, uh, a, few, a few years ago in my career about how one relationship, how one of those delivery drivers in 1991, 20 branches down the line led me to touring with Robert Plant from a delivery driver in 1991. And that's what I'm talking about. It's about networking. There wasn't a paper resume in that trail. It was making friends, getting to know people, and getting a reputation, a positive one, hopefully. Yeah, that's what we hear very often is just like the importance of networking, the importance of um, proving yourself to people, um, working hard, and, uh, and just being nice to people. And it, It's so simple, man. And I think people miss that, but just people want to be around good people. On a tour bus, a tour bus is 45 feet long. There are 12 bunks in a tour bus. If there's one bad apple, one bad attitude in that tour bus, it takes the whole vibe down. You want to be around people that you gel with, that you get along with. Yes, somebody occasionally leaves their shoes out or they're the messy one, but I'm talking about that person with just a sour attitude will take the whole bus down. Be nice. Go along, go and get along with people, and it will get you very, very far in this industry or in pretty much a lot of industries in life. It's the way it works. Mm -hmm. So say that somebody that's listening wants to do what you do, and maybe they're starting their education, maybe they're finishing their education, maybe they don't want to go to college for that, but they want to work in that industry. What would, how would you, um, what would you recommend to them to how, how, I'm trying to wear this right, mm -hmm. uh, how would you recommend they get started? Sure. And before I answer that, I'd like to just touch on the several career paths you can take within my industry because I think that's important because each of them have different ways and different processes that we would go through to get to them. But I would almost love to see everybody start out as a lighting technician. Whether you never desire to physically hit a button on a console that makes a light turn red or blue or whatever, uh, a lighting technician is an integral part of that crew. Uh, the next a career path would be um, a lighting director, somebody running the show at night, um, you know, just physically triggering the console, making it happen, talking to the spotlight operators. And then the final role would be the lighting designer, the, the vision that puts it down from, from artist and manager's ear uh, voices or, or, or notes and puts it on paper and makes that, that desire a reality, that lighting designer role. So those are the three paths that we can look at taking. But ultimately, no matter which one of those three you do, even if you want to be a lighting director, lighting designer, I think you need to start as a lighting technician. I think you need to know how the gear works, what its purposes are, and, and um, how it can be used. To, before you can design with it, you need to know how it works. And I think also touring as a lighting technician um, when you be hit the lighting designer phase of your career, you know what it's like to have toured and have to hung this light and how troublesome certain makes and models can be. And you start to see things from their eyes and you start to design rigs, hopefully in a way that are more friendly for everybody to work with. But to get back to your question about uh, the, the path, um, you know, I, I recommend a lot of people to go and start at a lighting company here in town. Again, this goes back to, to the lighting technician side of things. We're very fortunate that Nashville has become a hub of not only country music, but a pop, rock. Obviously, the CCM world's out of here. There are so many genres touring out of Nashville now that there are a lot of vendors and, and gear providers here. And unfortunately, or unfortunately in some circumstances, we're at a shortage. We're at an extreme shortage of lighting people right now. Um, there's a lot of young people come to town that want to be audio engineers, and I know that uh, they're, you know, a lot of the audio companies are doing what they can to get them in, but I know lighting companies are starving for people that want to know that facet of the industry. So I recommend you call one of, I mean, look, we've got, I could probably name eight lighting vendors here in town. You go and, and, and you go and start working with them. And yes, it, it stinks because you've just paid for a college education that may have cost you 200 grand or whatever. 
but and you're only going to be making 10 bucks an hour but you got to do it get in there show them that you can work hard start learning the terminology start showing them you're a team player and that you can handle responsibility and then that ten dollar an hour turns into a local show where you may make a couple hundred bucks for the day and then that local show turns into a small tour where you're making x and then that's low that small tour turns into a mega tour it's all part of that growth process Okay, so if we're a lighting technician and we're working at one of these companies and we're working our way up and we've busted our butt and we've done great and we're working our way up, the next step would be is is find a a, a baby actor, a new band that doesn't have a lighting director in place and see if you can start working with them. And one of the best ways that we've seen that happen are by being on a a major A-level tour and the support acts that might not have somebody. That's how a lot of the relationships I built in my career were founded by uh, those those support acts. Um, when I toured with Keith Urban in 2005, Miranda Lambert was our opening act. She had no LD, so I was I recognized her talent. I said, "Man, this girl is awesome. I love her stage presence. She's going to go somewhere." So I started just kind of helping them out and doing simple favors on the side, and far as far as design and creative, and. Literally, two years later, she was starting to headline small arenas, and they were like, hey, Chris, can you put together a design for us? And so that developed up over a, a seven- or eight-year relationship in which we're designing eight and nine truck tours uh, for her. So it's just an example of getting to know those smaller acts uh, and, and working with them. And so and it just, again, you're networking, you're, you're establishing relationships. And then hopefully, once you get an act like that that you've worked with, that'll turn into a full-time job where you're just touring with that artist. Uh, Instead of working as a lighting technician, helping run lights for an opening act, you're now touring as the lighting director for that same artist that might have carried you on that journey. And then the lighting designer phase of your career kind of comes with the aspect of, do you have enough clients or can you get enough clients to support a living? Because when you get to the design phase of your career, a lot of times you're having to step off the road. It's, you just can't manage being the creative side and going to meetings on Music Row, but also touring four or five days a week. And that's kind of a phase that a lot of us, uh, all, pretty much every designer I know, started out as a lighting director and we've been blessed with the opportunity that we were able to um, have enough clients to kind of just focus on the design side of our career. So you mentioned um, now that you're at a certain level, you're not touring with all of your clients, sure. but you, you still go to meetings and you still meet with these people to discuss what their needs are. What, what goes on in these meetings? What do you discuss? How do you, how do you work with the artists and their managers to make a show? Sure. Well, that's a great question. And I will tell you, you know, every artist is different in terms of their personal involvement to their show. Um, some of our clients are extremely involved uh, to, to, to the point of looking at every little detail we do. Some are very broad strokes. Um, a lot of times, more times than not, my initial meetings are with either the manager or a combination of the manager, the tour manager, and the production manager. Um, every now and then, the artists will be in there at the initial meetings. But really what I'm trying to do then, then at those meetings is get some very basic parameters that I'm going to need to start to create a process. A parameter is like, how many trucks does this, need, need to, this, does this show need to fit in? What size venues are we playing? What's your weekly budget? How, many, how much staff do you want to have on the road? Um, just things that I want to be able to have in my head as I design, because what I don't want to do is sell them on something and find out that it's going to cost uh, you know, another $8,000 a week to add a semi-truck and that it won't fit in most of these venues they're playing because I won't get repeat business that way. And that's a big part of what I think we bring to the table is we try to fit within parameters. So I'm taking all those logistical pieces, putting those together. Then I'm also trying to get keywords. I always ask them for keywords. And keywords to me are, are things that describe the vibe or feel that they want of that show. Um, and sometimes it's blatantly obvious. Like Miranda's Platinum Tour, it was, you know, it was platinum. We played off of that texture and, and the metal platinum, you know. Um, for a, a One Republic tour, we played off of uh, geometry and shapes. You know, uh, with Jason Aldean, we played off of uh, a lot of uh, his personality and his activeness on stage. Um, I knew that he was all over the place. So I needed places for him to go. Um, so I'm looking for keywords and things I can bring back to the table and start to use to, to put together creative ideas. And so we do that. 
uh, depending on the size of the tour, that's usually anywhere from it could be as soon as three months out to as long as nine months out before a tour starts. The more time we have, the better, because the more time I have to get it creatively where they need it and also to get the best deals on gear rather than, rather, rather than waiting at the last minute and having to pay premiums for getting stuff in. Mm -hmm. So we go through that. So I take their notes. I, uh, I take them and I have a, a software program um, that basically I create renderings, pictures for them, and I start shooting those via email. Uh, sometimes, again, it's to the management group or it's to the artist or to a combination of them and start getting notes. What do you like? What do you not like? And we kind of whittle that process down to hopefully we get to something that everybody loves. From there, we start uh, piecing it out and sending out bid bid packets to staging vendors, lighting video vendors, video vendors, scenic vendors, and just start getting pricing in, um, you know, uh, uh, making sure that we can afford it. And um, once we've seen the pricing and we know what vendors we're going to go with, we, we make um, logistical tweaks as necessary. If, if, if lighting's coming in uh, $5,000 higher a week than it needs to, we decide what's worth trimming. And same thing with, with video or, or staging. We, we get it where it needs to be. And um, so it's a, it's a process. It it's definitely takes some time and some patience and a lot of good communication. Back to the Aldean tour. How did you account for his him being all over the place? Was did you just have a couple active spotlights, or did you design full mini shows to pop up wherever he landed? No, I mean it really for for that specific show because Jason is just very athletic and he's active and he's all over the stage. I needed physical places for him to go. It, you know, in a typical arena, we get a standard sixty wide by forty deep stage. I didn't want this to be standard. I needed places. And, and in Jason's case, I knew I could light him from wherever, from the fixtures above. That's fine. That's the genius of our lighting rigs today is we can aim them to hit. That's great. But I needed places. And places um, in my head are not only uh, you know extensions of the stage, but they're elevations and height too. So with Jason, we created a, um, the whole design was created off of the shape, the hexagon. Uh, six-sided. So yeah, when you see the video screen, it's a hexagon, and that extends down all the way to the band risers to the thrust that comes off the stage. So now what we've got Jason doing is we've got a thrust that's shaped like a hexagon. We've got a riser system with ramps going up, and then I've got side pieces off the side of the stage that are hexagon shaped that has ramps up to them. So now I've given him a miniature playground uh, on that stage, just places for him to go and get near the audience and uh, different levels in height. We love that. We, we don't want di flat dimension. We love as designers dimension to, to everything, and that includes people and getting them around the stage. So that was the case there. It's just giving him a playground, and uh, I think it worked well. I think he's pretty happy from what I can tell. Is that one of the current tours? That it's on? current tour, yeah. We launched that in uh, uh, mid-April, mid to late April, and um, that runs through like late October. So yeah, they're out on, on the weekends, and um, uh, playing a mixture of arenas and amphitheaters and some fairs and festivals as well. Mm -hmm. Do they take the same stage set up to each of the different places? They do, but uh, that's a good example of one of the things I was directed at by management is we had, as much as we, we want everything to be the same night after night for consistency, we also get to the point where we can't control how a venue is built. And, and the amphitheaters all across this country vary greatly in terms of uh, what the stage looks like in terms of shape, uh, how high it is, how deep it is, how much weight we can hold from the ceiling. And so with that, they're having to adapt the rig as we go. And that's something management had said is, I need, we need something adaptable because one night we'll be an arena where we can hang everything. The next night will be a festival where we can only hang just a video wall. And then the next night's an amphitheater where we can maybe hang 75% of it. So in, when I designed it, I knew that it was created in layers so that, okay, here's the, here is what we have to have every night. Every night has to be the video screen. That's the centerpiece. That's what that's right there. And then you kind of create these other elements around it and know what you can peel off to fit in these venues and things. How did you evolve from being a lighting designer to a stage a set designer? That's a, that's another great question because you know lighting designer has obviously been a term that's been around for for years and years comes from the theater world and, and and as I've explained you know we're the ones lighting designers create the the you know the visual lighting element of the show. Well, in the past 10 12 years lighting control uh, as far as the person running lights at, at the shows, has been able to control video elements as well. And so when that started happening, 
it started to become a little bit more holistic, which is great. Um, it, it, that lighting could now have access to the content being played on the video screen in terms of what what speed it's running at, what colors may be overlaid with it, and transitions in and out of it. With that absorption of, of lighting and video together, we kind of ch started changing our names instead of lighting designers, started calling ourselves production designers. Uh, and in other words, we're painting a bigger picture. So now, instead of saying, selling myself as a lighting designer, I try to sell myself as a production designer. Because if you have one person creating all those visual elements for a show, you have a more big picture of you instead of one person doing a set and staging design, one person doing a video design, and one person doing a lighting design who may not all be on the same page or may have interpreted notes from managers differently. You've got one person now creating that big picture. You're going to get a more holistic look. And with that too, my specific style of lighting is very, it's, it, it's kind of the way I've always done it, but I'm very... Uh, very very straightforward my colors. I don't do a lot of pastels, I, and you will rarely see more than two colors at any given time during any of the songs that I like. I like very big, bold looks. With that, now that we can control how video plays in and how lighting plays with video, instead of having video that's green and, and, and red and having lights that are blue and white and it looking like a Christmas tree, we can now make sure everything's marrying together and that lighting and video are accenting each other with the same colors. So now we have, again, a more holistic picture. And so that's kind of the goal. You started talking about how with each of the different songs or at any one time, there's only two colors, right? What are some of the other elements or basic elements as far as design goes for um, either lighting specifically or production in general? Okay, no, that's good. So what we do is when we start working on a tour, we basically create a, uh, it's an Excel spreadsheet, and and with it, we, we work with the artist early on to try to get what we hope is the set list for the show, knowing that it could and will likely change. And we basically list out the set list, and then I have columns for um, lighting colors. Um, I have songs for video, con uh, or a column for video content, what colors that content is. I have a note for scenic. And then I have just some other general production notes. Uh, some tours, I'll have a column for pyro. And basically, we start going through and we look at, the first thing we do is map out what songs are we going to do video content for. Because one thing I don't want is video content every song. As a society in general right now, we're constantly inundated with looking at screens. We're looking at screens constantly. And so I love it that during a show, we take a break from screens. And I think it's mandatory. I think that during a night, we have to take, you know, every four to five songs, let's take a break and, take, and, and shut down the screens. And so with that, we start mapping out what songs are going to have content and what songs are not. From there, we start thinking about what is that content going to look like, and we create style guides. So we'll take a song, and we'll kind of take our vision for what would be happening visually during that song, and basically do Google image searches showing, um, showing you know, what textures or patterns or themes might be happening video content-wise. And as those t uh, textures and pictures start coming together, or uh, we start to pull colors from that, and we know that, okay, if we're going to take this song to a red and orange level, we're going to use red and orange for, for you know, lights. And then we just kind of start mapping it out, and we'll map out um, automation, um, you know, it, our trusses moving, or things moving, or curtains moving, or um, are there props that come in. And literally, it's just a massive spreadsheet that we kind of fill out. So, and it's, it's our Bible for that production. And that's basically what I call it as a production guide. So who, who decides what the song is going to look like? Um, a lot of times I'm hopeful that I'm that person in my role, that I'm, I'm leading that creative charge. Um, sometimes, um, because uh, of just different relationships, the artists or the managers will have people they like to use for their video elements, and we'll work with them. But again, we all, it's a small town, we all play well with each other, and we, um, you know, we, we try to, you know, be open-minded. So if the video content creator is saying, hey, man, I'm really, I need to take what was going to be a red and orange song and take it more blue-green, I'll be like, you know what, okay, we don't have two blue-green songs back-to-back, -back, which is something I'm looking out for. Yeah, let's take it blue-green. I just don't want the show to be repetitive. So as long as it works from a, a, a visual standpoint, yeah, be very open-minded. So, But there's definitely a, a variety of relationships there. And, uh, you know, in town, there's a variety of people that create video content for a tour. That's, that's a big business here in town. 
so I know when putting together the set list for songs, there's a show flow that you want to go with where you start kind of big and then you grow bigger, you grow bigger, and then you kind of go down, you let people chill and relax, take a little break, and then you go big again to the end. Right. right? Um, and that just helps people stay engaged to your songs. Um, do you do the same thing with the production design? Do you follow a type of show flow that you want to do? I, I, I personally, yeah, I love to. I love, I, I think you got to come out of the gate and, and, and do something amazing. Now, with that, I will say also that I'm also a big fan of the first song. Those people are there to see whoever's name's on the marquee. And if we're distracting too much with ancillary lighting and video and things are moving, they're missing the person they paid all that money to see. Okay? But if we want that opening number to be cool. The opening of the show is going to be cool. And sometimes that happens prior to the first time we see the artist. But we got to start the show with a, with a bang. And we need to end the show with a bang. It's got to, we, we want to leave them walking away going, that was an amazing experience. And that's one of the things we're very conscious of is that throughout the night, we're strategically layering in what we might call gags or production elements so that there's a, just surprises along the way. That way by song two, they haven't gone, oh, I've seen every light in the rig. We're waiting till song five or six to add, oh, I didn't know they had lights over there. That's cool. Or, oh, they, they uh, had confetti. Uh, on the last song, you know, you don't want to do confetti the second song because people have crap in their hair for the next <laughs> hour and a half. But uh, yeah, it's strategically layering in moments, and then again, like I said, sometimes those moments need to be that heartfelt ballad that the singer wrote about his mother that passed away. They, we don't need to distract the audience; they want that connection. It doesn't need to be a video image. It needs to be that that time with the audience, and I'm very conscious of that. I think that's what people want need. What are some examples of high energy elements for show. sure um you know uh things that move automation you know on some of the up-tempo songs we'll we'll take the entire lighting rig and have the physical structure move down you know in time with the music and when you see something of of that scale something that would fits in four or five semi trucks start to move and uh kind of look like a giant transformer that's impactful um you know the use of um uh, pyro or, or other effects, lasers, uh, cryojet, smoke, things like that can be really cool gags. Um, you know, and sometimes it's scenic pieces on, that come in and out. Um, you know, I remember on a Miranda tour, we had a five foot wide mirror ball for, um, for the song All Kinds of Kinds. You know, there's things that happen that people remember, like, hey, remember when every light went out and all of a sudden, you know, I had 30 lights hitting a mirror ball. The whole arena, I mean, it looked like a, a massive high school prom. It was amazing. And, you know, you just find those cool moments that you that you create and, and you know, try to do it within a budget and, and uh, makes everybody happy. Yeah. When you were talking about the moving lighting rigs, it reminded me, I went to Bonnaroo well, this yeah. past year and the weekend. I don't know if you've seen his show or if you've heard about his show. His entire lighting rig it's this big triangle yeah. and it just like lowered and then like m like i don't know how we can describe it we might add pictures in the yeah. show notes for it but like it it's moving pretty much the whole show up and down and like yeah. changing directions and like spinning and they're they're fire coming out the tops and bottom of it oh, yeah. and so it's it's a crazy thing i'm like how did they work this out this huge piece of like scaffolding and metal yeah. and lights and fire and and lasers and stuff like moving around and it's it was such an amazing show just to be like just visually just so engaged and my mind was blown being like how did they do that yeah yeah i love yeah. Like that. yeah that oddly enough um so i i've seen photos of that design and uh it's an amazing design the designer there was two designers for that the production designer uh, was a gal named s s e s delvin I believe is how you say her last name. And she is, I want to say British, or she lives in the in Europe. But the lighting designer of the tour was Suna Ruthier, who lives actually just a few blocks from here. She did all the lighting design for that tour. She's an amazing lighting designer and does some great work. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's impressive. The photos I've seen in the video clips and stuff are really, really cool. And again, as you mentioned, that kept you, you know, the whole show. And that's a unique show, too, because The weekend is not about a 10-piece band. I mean, it's him. He's out there doing his thing. And, 
you know, uh, if we just watch one dude all night, just sit there and sing, yes, he's a great singer, but we needed, he, he needs an amazing production and he got that. I mean, that's, it's all about that environment. Same thing with, you know, even like Muse, three piece band, but they have these amazing shows that kind of fill in the, the blanks of where there's not people and stuff. And that's what people go. People go to see that or like Trans Siberian Orchestra, you know, that's about production, you know, big shows. I just remembered, remember when uh, we first met and I was talking about the one group that does like the EDM stuff and they have the blade glitch mob. That's the oh, okay. Glitch mob is great. That's I who love they are. Ah, I got you. They're, I haven't, I haven't seen them, but I have to check them out. Yeah. Like they, they're, they either do all of the production design themselves or they're very nitpicky with their designers. Um, cause, cause they all have like a creative vision of what it, they want it to look like. And, and, and again, that's a great cool. example. Some artists are that involved and, and, and man, I, I can't sit here and say that there's uh, it's all male or all female artists that are one way or the other, but they're all over the board. But some artists have a very specific, you know, d- desire. And, and uh, for instance, we did a, a tour with Need to Breathe. Um, Eric Parker works with me, and uh, he 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 and I worked on that design together, and then he toured with it. And um, one of the brothers, the guitar brother, and I get their names mixed up. Um, I think that's Bo. He was so about the production that he had notes nightly. He had like simple cues that he wanted to see that in his head there was a moment happening. And um, he would sit out there with Eric and, and finesse. And I'm talking minor details with some lights and shades because he had this vision because that was he was into that. And it, it was really cool. He actually, I told him, he impressed me because it um, he came up with some really cool stuff. I'm like, man, if you ever get tired of this guitar stuff, I'll give you a job, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, some artists are just really involved like that. Yeah, It's a good segue into my next question that I wanted to ask. Sure. Has there ever been a bad experience where an artist wanted something that either one wasn't possible or two you knew wouldn't work and how did you work that out to come to a understanding yeah no that's a a very fair question i will tell you due to non-disclosure agreements i won't list artist names of course (laughs) Uh, man I, i toured with an artist at one time who was um he he had a very hard time explaining what he wanted uh he couldn't get his vision across and he was somebody that cared about production about the way the show looked but he couldn't use the words he couldn't verbalize it and he would use very um uh, uh, random words like murky or swampy or uh this or sad or he just used words that were like i want this to feel blah 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 like okay man i don't know how to translate that into a color so i'm gonna do my best so that was challenging and, and it literally took in that case, getting him to sit with me at the lighting console and going, okay, here we are at this moment of the show. Tell me exactly what it is you want to see. And then once they see you on a console physically manipulating lights, and it gets better. Um, a lot of times, to answer your question further, it's it's managing their expectations from a, from a, um, from a budgetary standpoint. There's that saying that sometimes our eyes are bigger than our stomach. And these artists go see a show like The Weeknd, and they're like, I want a freaking spaceship above the stage that comes in and opens up and I come out in a suit that lights up and that's awesome. And I said, okay, how much, bu- you know, what, what, what kind of budget do you have or what kind of truck space? They're like, well, we got, you know, $5,000 in, in a trailer behind a Sprinter van. I'm like, you're not going <laughs> to, you know, that's an, ex- I'm, I'm using that as, as a goofy example, but we do have to do that a lot. We have to manage expectations. And, and, and a lot of times in those initial meetings with managers or artists, we'll get big picture things like, Man, I would love to have a 70-foot wide video screen. And I'm like, dude, I've seen your budget numbers, and we're going to get a 7-foot wide video screen. And it's things like that tends to be where we have to manage. And luckily, uh, most managers are, are versed enough in what things cost that they can help us with the artist and those conversations. So what's been, what's been like the best show that you've, that you've worked on? And like, what was it like? You know, for a variety of reasons, and I know it's it's fresh, I'm really proud of um, Jason Aldean this year. That was a big deal for me. Um, and, and it really is for more personal reasons than anything. And, and without getting into a lot of detail, that 2016 was a rough year for me, uh, business-wise and personal. And it, I kind of looked at it as my comeback tour. Um, I put a lot of heart into that one. A lot of heart that people will never see. And... Uh, yeah, it was a big deal. Um, I was very proud of that. And then um, I, looking back, um, I would say One Republic's native tour was very special to me because over 
a two-year period, that tour grew and manipulated constantly. Uh, uh, it just, it just, it just became this thing. Um, it started out as a very simple European club run when we did the initial design with one small video screen, and by the time the thing ended, it was selling out arenas in Johannesburg, South Africa, and we did a DVD shoot, and it was a massive production in two years. And so it was just, it was such an amazing journey to have one design, one screen grow into seven screens and this big thing. And I was very proud to be a part of that for sure. What's some of the terminology that would make it easier to describe what an artist wants? Oh, wow. Um, it kind of goes back to keywords and they're going to be different for every tour. Um, and, and those keywords sometimes... Uh, play off of an album title or a theme in an album or, or to an artist persona or their vibe. Um, you know, uh, lighting a Chris Stapleton show would be way different than lighting, um, you know, a, a Rascal Flat show. There's just different things going on there, even with just physical appearance and personality and song structure. And I think when I'm trying to pull those keywords out of artists and their managers, it's reflective by those things. It's, it's um, you know, what do you want the audience walking away at, at the end of the night having remembered about your show what is it you know and for instance and i didn't do stapleton's design but you know if with him it's about music i do know that and and i've spoken with his designer and if you see that show i mean it's a cool lighting rig and it's a unique stage look but it was about chris wanted people to walk away remembering the night musically they literally designed a structure on stage it's it's a dome shape because it's it's designed for acoustic reasons it's not about hey we want a cool dome shaped visual it's about acoustics and the best audio experience for our, our 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 fans, and then we'll incorporate lights among that. So, but it's getting in and finding out what they want, and that's what Chris wanted. Um, you know, and, and it's just those conversations. Um, and and again, they're different for every artist. Do you know most, if not all, of the LDs in town? I think it sounds cocky for me to say yes. But I would say I know a good 75 to 80 percent of them, and, and and there's another reason why. But uh, you know, keep in mind, as I stated earlier, it's not just about country music here anymore. It's about CCM and pop rock. Um, I don't know as many of the uh, LDs in the CCM world just because I haven't done a lot in that world. Um, but I would say country LDs, I know a good 90, 95 percent of them. It's just it's a small town. That's where I was getting. <laughs> it's a very small, small town. town. We all know each other, which is good in the networking sense. And when you know somebody's available and that you hear of a gig coming up, it's good for that. But it's also bad because if you start making bad decisions, mistakes, if you have a drug problem, alcohol problem, you don't get along with people, those reputations spread fast too. It's funny. I'll do uh, some Facebook posts from time to time because I I use social media as a tool to help find out who's available. And I'll do posts that say, "Hey, uh, looking for somebody who's available starting in September." Um, and and like of all the reply, and I'll have people send me direct messages. Hey, and, and and of those, there are a good four or five people that are always the same ones replying that nobody cares to work with because they got a bad reputation for mm. you know being. Uh, maybe they have a, a habit, a bad habit, a uh, drinking problem or whatever, or they, they don't get along with people. And so uh, I would say if you're a good LD in this town, you are definitely working right now. If you're not working right now, there's something wrong because it is absolutely busy right now. Let, let's say that that someone out there is a really good LD, but they're not working because they're not known yet, right? How How do they start meeting all you guys how do they start getting their name out there starting to say hey i'm i'm a reliable and reputable player how can they start building that name and starting to get to know everybody you know it just takes time but i would say again going back to you've got to be at the early stages of that networking tree and that may mean you start working at a lighting company or you start working as a a stagehand here in town work for crew one or rhino or whoever uh, but you start you start networking start building that tree it's it's getting out and meeting people you know um a uh, uh, touring career workshop which i'll segue on later is um um you know we have networking events with the sole purpose is come and meet people that's that's why we do them just come meet people it's so important and um i would say that you just got to get out there and start um uh, Start start planting seeds in your networking tree, you know, get get those first branches going and those will turn in and stay in touch with people. Don't be annoying, but stay in touch with people. 
Social media is great too. I mean, uh, you know, I, 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 even though I'm one of the older ones uh, in town, I, I think it's great for just knowing who's out on what tour and what people are doing. How do you stay in touch without being annoying? I, I'm a fan of, I love people that are great communicators. If you're uh, texting me every week, you're starting to annoy me. I'm, and that's, and that's, that's, that's because, uh, not to sound cocky, but I'm busy. I'm a, I'm a busy guy. There's just a lot going on. And it, it sometimes gets distracting if you get hounded by the same people over and over. But reach out to me monthly. I have no problem with that. Shoot me an email and say, hey, just checking in if you hear of anything. Because if you shout, shoot me an email and I know you're available and I hear about a gig, you're fresh in my mind. Uh, weekly, you're just going to be too fresh in my mind. I'm going to be like, I'm not going to put this person. It's too annoying. I'm not going to put them on a tour. I like monthly personally. That's what I preach. But, uh, you know, you just got to feel your way around it and stay in touch with stay. Again, it's about staying in touch with your production managers and tour managers. Those are the people. I'd rather have more friends that are production managers and tour managers than anything else because that's who's giving gigs, you know, and ultimately managers as well. But that's where they're coming from. So what do you do and who do you go to to when you need help with anything, like a, a mentor or just anyone that maybe could give you advice? What would you do? At, at my age now, I mean, um, I um, there's still a handful of guys here in town that I can fight in. But I, I'm a, I, one of the things I preach is having a team around you. Um, and my team is comprised of a lot of people. And, and, and um, it, it, you know... It's, it took me a while to assemble my team, and this will probably be a good segue in a minute for me to talk about Touring Career Workshop because it's one of the big basis of what we do there. But um, my team is consisted of a, uh, of, of a lawyer, a great lawyer, a great accountant. Um, I, have, um, uh, I have great doctors. I mean that literally. I have a great trainer. Um, I, have, um, I have a great life coach. Um, I have, you know, I'm again, thankfully blessed to have grown up here. I have two great parents here in town. Um, but I have a team around me. I've got a great girlfriend. I've got an amazing son. I've got great people in my life. And, um, my dad's still a mentor. My dad was a business guy. He's still a, a very wise man and, and he's great to bounce things off of. My brother, uh, is a real estate developer here in town. He's younger, but he, 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 he knows about business. Again, I'm not college educated, so there's a lot of things I'm figuring out on my own, as a, especially as somebody who doesn't have a college degree that has two full-time employees. There's a lot of things I've had to learn, and I turned to my mentors. I've got a, a financial advisor, Troy Von Hafen. I've worked with him for 16 years now, and he literally took me from having no retirement to, to being well on my way to being able to retire. Uh, and have something at retirement, but it's a team. You got to have a team around you. Um, I don't have one specific mentor now, but um, uh, there, you know, depending on the scenario and what I need help with, I just I go to one of my team members. I think that I think for some people it's a pastor. Um, you know, it's it's just you need to get a team around you. And if you're young and coming up, um, you know, I'm not saying go out shell out thousands of dollars to have accountants and lawyers, but there are, there's there, there's always can be a team member of different levels. And you need to have people around you, uh, and people that think reasonably and soundly, and, and and will be honest with you. That's really good advice. So let's talk about that that workshop, tour and career workshop. So, uh, you know, this this started. This will be, I believe, our sixth year. I hope I don't get that wrong. But basically, here here it is in a nutshell. Coming up in town, I had people that mentored me. I had people that took me under their wing, and as I got older, I started seeing some of my mentors struggle. Uh, struggle physically, struggle financially. Uh, they made a lot of mistakes in their careers, and um, just they weren't able to sustain a lifestyle. They weren't able to tour anymore, and it broke my heart. Along the same lines, about that, you know, so, so as, as I was seeing my mentors, some of my mentors having a hard time. I was at a point where I was getting a lot of call from young people going, "Hey, who do you use for? A, who's your accountant? And who do you like for health insurance? And who do you like for this?" And I'm like. And so Eric Parker uh, and I were started talking like, man, we ought to do something. Like we ought to do this kind of this thing where one night we just have our buddies get up or our our team get up and talk a little bit about different aspects of the industry from a human resources level. Because at the end of the day, most of us in the industry are self-employed. Uh, we may go work for an artist for time to time or for a vendor, but we're all our own businesses at the end of the day. We're fending for ourselves. We don't have human resource departments. And with that, 
we created the Touring Career Workshop. We're an official 501c3 nonprofit. We're funded by donations from uh, uh, vendors here in town. We're funded very generously. And um, with that, we, we put on a big workshop. Um, and I can go ahead and announce now because it's official, but this year's workshop will be on Wednesday, October 25th at uh, Soundcheck Annex. And we'll do more social media on that. But basically, it's free, completely free. We're going to feed you. We're probably gonna, actually going to get two meals over the night. Um, and you're going to get five hours of in-depth um, um, education um, from any, anything from a keynote speaker talking about a career journey to up to 12, 13, 14 different sessions you can pick from to learn about tax planning, retirement planning, health insurance, how to make your marriage work on the road, how to be a parent while you're on the road, how to stay fit while you're on the road, how to deal with the stress of being on the road. Um, just these are just the topics that we've dealt with. Just just the real the realistic things that we have to deal with. And so uh, we do that every year. And then additionally, we do quarterly networking nights. Um, you know, usually January, April, June, something like that. We do those. And then uh, the the last thing that we do is we have a program we call it the All Access Program. And basically, um, we will pay for your first two sessions to go to a counselor or life coach. Uh, we have four of them listed on our website. If you're going through some stuff, if you're struggling, we want you to get in and talk to somebody. And we literally, we just receive a bill. We don't know your name. We don't know what you talked about, but we pay for it. And if you need more, we, we talk with the, the counselors about that and, and see if we can't help you there. But that's that's how we give back to our community. And something I believe very strongly in. It's, it's, we're not paid. Eric's not paid. I'm not paid. We have a couple other staff members that are uh, that are not paid we're all doing it because we love our industry and we want to give back Amazing. what website can people go to to find out touring career workshop.com i would also advise them to follow us on social media uh facebook we're very active on facebook and we post a lot of our event information there about um, the the networking night and of course our big event which will be october 25th this year and you said that was free. Is Absolutely. it something that you have to still sign up for, just so they know you're coming? Yeah, we, we do. We like to we like for people to sign up. We don't have that quite up yet. That'll probably be up here in the next month or so. But we we like people to sign up so we can gauge how many people are planning to attend which sessions, and so we can assign what rooms they're going to be in accordingly. Um, but uh, yeah, last year we've grown. The first year we did it at Belmont University, um, we had 50 people attend. Um, last year we had 350. And so it's just grown and grown and grown. I'm so proud of it. Uh, and I'm so proud of how our communities and embraced it. And, um, and, and again, the vendors uh, and the speakers, everybody's doing that. Everybody's come to the table, and, and, and it's an amazing thing to see happen. And is this uh, just for LDs around here? Or? Touring production professionals. Okay. I don't care what your career path is. We've even had musicians show up, and I don't mind that a bit. I think musicians and entertainers have more resources than than production staff do in town. So, but it, I don't care what your whatever. Even if you're just thinking about getting in the touring industry, come see us and come network. At the very least, you're going to have 349 other people in the room that you can get to know and start start working on that networking tree and start getting out there. What are some of the new and exciting pieces of tech? that you see coming up out of the works? Oh, you? sure. Um, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot of talk about virtual reality and how it will be used in concerts. And I've got a variety of emotions and feelings on that. I actually, I was on a panel recently uh, where they had four of us up there, and then that was the very question is, where is technology for concerts heading? And one gentleman was in the virtual reality world, and he was talking about, hey, in the next few years, you're going to be able to sit front row at any concert you want from your, from your living room. And, and I, uh, I disagreed with him. I said, man, I, I love the technology. I love that you guys are pursuing this. I said, but what you're taking out of it is that we need human interaction and human connection. And you can't virtual reality the fill the energy that's in a room during a concert, the physical the connection with other people, the feel of the bass in your chest and the smell of the stale beer and, the, and, and that general environment. You cannot recreate that. Yes, you can put goggles on and see the artist better than you could uh, sitting in the back of the arena, but you can't take that away. Um, however, I think there's going to be places for that, and I think we'll be able to find creative ways to use that in our shows. Um, I think we're going to see more and more with holograms. I think I think uh, to what aspect that is, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be tours of artists that are perhaps deceased that you know, we may see a full Michael Jackson tour. Who knows? Um, or if it's just simple duets during a night where an artist sings with a hologram. I think that we're going to see more and more of that stuff. Um, 
we're already come up, we've already come a long way with interactive um, um, LED and items like that with the audience where we're giving them uh, wristbands or bracelets or necklaces or whatever it may be. And via the lighting controller and media servers, we're able to create effects within the room. Um, you know, it's, it's an expensive trick, but it's, it's, it's out there. And it's one of those things that hopefully we can make uh, less expensive as time goes on. Well, they, they did the bracelets with the, the National Predators, the playoff game. Yes, exactly. Where they turned off all the lights, yep. had everyone hold their hand up, and did a whole light show with the people yeah. or the lights. Yeah. And so that was really amazing to see. I, didn't, well, I wasn't there in person, but yes. seeing it on, on TV. It's huge for our yeah. city. Yeah. That would be an amazing thing at a show. And I know it's, it's happened before, and I would yeah. love to... Love to see that. It is, you know, it's it's definitely something that you know we want to do. It's just that again, those bracelets. I, I don't want to quote different companies, but I know they can be up to four or five dollars each. Yeah. And when you have an arena of twenty thousand, that's eighty to hundred thousand dollars in just bracelets. Yeah. So obviously, you've got to roll that cost back onto the ticket. Is it worth it then? To you know, it, it just got to find the right time and place. So hopefully, it gets less expensive and we can find more opportunities. But I think it's amazing. I think anytime we can bring the audience a little bit more in to be a part of the show. I think we've done something special because at the end of the day, that's something we're all very conscious of is these people uh, have been working their butts off. They've been marked that date on their calendar months ago. And even though that I may be jaded sitting in the crowd, having gone to the same show, you know, for the other three months that the tour has been going on to that person that night, that might be someone's first concert or you never know what stresses they're dealing with in their life, but they've saved their money and that is their night. So anytime that we can connect with them and make that the most amazing experience, it only benefits all of us because it leaves them. They've left having an amazing experience and gives them some more richness in their life. They left entertained, which we have to have. And, and, and for our artist end, they get the reputation of entertaining people. People are going to keep coming to shows, which keeps us all employed. That's what we need. Who are some up and comers in the production design world right now? You know, there's a lot of talent out there, and and we definitely keep our eye open. And you know, Eric Parker that works for me is an amazing designer in his own right. Um, Eric, I, when I taught at Belmont, he was one of my students. He was actually in the first class I ever taught. And, um, he toured on several tours I designed, and just always loved his work ethic and his personality and his attitude. And he's a great designer. But you know, this town we've got some some really amazing talent, and, and even outside of town, there's some great designers in Chicago and L.A. and stuff. And uh, you know, um, I, you know, it, it's one of those funny things because we are we we do compete. We have to compete with each other. And there are times where we all three or four of us will, will submit designs to compete to get the same tour, and I may not get it or they may not get it. So we try to keep it friendly. I mean, and I tr like I said, it comes back to being nice. Do I want to lose to them? No, I want to win. Of course I do. I want I want to win for my, my sake and my employee's sake and my family's sake. But um, at the end of the day, I want to be able to see them and have a beer with them too and, and to know that it's – it's all good, um, uh, and that's something I'm thankful for. Is that we've been blessed enough that we have work, and we've we've had enough work to support us. And you're just not going to get them all, and and that's the nice thing. Like I said, guys, there's a lot of work here in town. I can't do it all, and neither can my competition. So if we can spread the love around, and 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 then it's fine. I think the one thing I don't like is when it does get sneaky and backhanded, and there are some people that do things sneaky and backhanded. That's where I start to lose respect and have a problem. But it it you know. It's it's been in the past even open enough that somebody will call and say, hey, uh, I hear you're submitting a design for so-and-so. Just letting you know I'm submitting as well. Cool. Thanks for being on that. I mean, I'd, I'd rather have that call and have lost to that person than to find out that they were sneaking around that, uh, you know, a gig you already had talking to the manager, which does happen. I mean, you, you definitely know who you can trust and who you can't. But again, I go out and we try to work ethically and uh, treat people the right way and hope that that uh, karma, blessings, grace, whatever you call it, come back on us and that we can continue to be successful. Yeah. You mentioned um, teaching a class at Belmont. What was that about? Yeah, yeah. I started, I taught there. Basically, this is the first year I haven't taught. But oddly enough, I taught a class um, I taught two classes, but the main class I taught was called Tour Production, and I started teaching that in January of 07. In fact, Trent, my son, uh, was only three days old when I taught my first class. And it was just, I was an adjunct professor. I taught uh, one or two nights a week, depending on um, 
this semester, but I taught this tour production class where we taught basically the process of putting a tour on the road from um, from the time it gets booked to the time that the show's done and the roles of a tour manager, the roles of a production manager and all that. And that, that all stems back from something we haven't talked about today, but I have a whole second career as well. Well, I guess a third career if you count tour and career workshop, but um, my company also does event production. Um, and, 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 you know, growing up here in town, part of my career, I spent working for an event producer here in town. And so I got a good bit of experience in putting together events. And so Event PM, which is a sister company to CLLD, the lighting company, um, we are contracted with the city of Nashville. You know, we put on July 4th and New Year's Eve, or we do the production for those. So the Belmont class really came from the event side of things. And, and actually, I've toured as a production manager as well. I, when I toured, uh, my last tour was with Robert Plant. Um, I toured as his lighting, lighting director, designer, and production manager. So um, I've, it's one of those scenarios where I wore a couple hats. So that's where that all stems from. But it was good. And then also at Belmont, we taught, uh, I taught a lighting class uh, a few semesters as well. It just, it was really difficult to teach in a classroom. I felt like it was something better suited to teach in a, an environment where you physically had lights and room to, to be able to use them. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, doing the production stuff for like the 4th of July in Nashville. Was that just at the stage on Broadway or was that also at Ascend or like the whole thing? The whole thing. We've all, done that. Wow. Uh, this was year. This is our ninth year. Uh, uh, we're contracted through, like I said, it's actually the Nashville Convention and Visitors Bureau puts on those shows. Um, but yeah, we, um, Mark Anderson is my other employee um, and he is over the event PM side of the company and he literally, he's the one pulling those shows off and, and we do everything. We coordinate stage, lights, video, sound, power, crews, cable ramps. Uh, we don't book the town. We don't launch the fireworks. We don't do those. But uh, yeah, the city, we're, we're, we're full turnkey and we, we do that and we help them with the bid process and all that. So it's it's enough work that that's pretty much Mark's full-time job. Every, once one event ends, we're already on it. I actually had a, 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 a an hour-long conference call today about New Year's because we're well along the ways of planning New Year's right now. And I don't know if this was something that was planned, but I, I went to the 4th of July thing and as I was walking from the main stage that was on Broadway to a Sand Amphitheater, that was a little section with like a big video monitor and like speakers and everything so people could watch it and, and not be in the big crowds. I don't know if this was planned at all, but as we were going to then we could see the, the video, the sound from that little section was synced with the sound from the stage. So you could still feel the music from the stage a couple blocks away. Yeah. And then see it, and it timed up perfectly. That's good. And it was such a strange, like, I was like, what, what is working right now? This is weird, but, like, I like it. That means everything was correct. Yeah. <laughs> were you at Walk of Fame Park? Do you recall, was that, were you walking by the Hilton Hotel? Um, yes. I think, I, yeah, because yeah, we were yeah. walking from Broadway, too. That was all intentional. Yeah. I mean, we hired, the vendors we use are fantastic, and this year, audio was sound image, and video was media visions. They work together to time align as much of that as they can within the realm of physics, you know. Um, but, yeah, that's all intentional. Yeah, uh, that's and, sound delay. From the perfect. live stage matched right up. That's they they have you know they walk around with their tablets and they're time aligning things and I'm like uh, you know God bless them it's amazing but yeah that's you know again I mean that was days and days of setting that up and uh, we had I want to say at the end of the day it was 19 miles of fiber optic cable uh, in downtown Nashville because we had speakers up at the courthouse we had things that people don't even realize um, it took a lot of Cable, a lot of manpower. Well, it was a quarter of a million people downtown on the street. Yeah, exactly. Night, so yeah, you gotta yeah. you gotta go all out for that. Super proud. I mean, and we didn't have rain. Thank goodness, yeah. man. Uh, that uh, it, it it happens. This was uh, this was actually. I think we've had rain the past three July fourths until this year, and so we just. Oh my gosh, it was so thankful to not have rain. Yeah, I had no idea that you did that. Yeah, that you that's uh, wow. yeah. We I've worked hard to keep the branding um, of my company starting. We've always been Chris Lyle Lighting Design, but this year I became an LLC. And I'm really working hard to keep the branding separate um, and because I found that having my name attached to the event side, that it was starting to confuse people. Well, is he a production manager or is he a lighting designer? And lighting design and production design is my passion. That is what I love. 
And um, even though I love putting events together, it just it was it was time to pull my name physically off of those, and that's why Event PM became that company. Um, and and Mark runs it, and he does a great job. And I've got his back. I mean, I'm there at the shows. I was at Ascend that night. I was running that stage, and um, I, I still enjoy that. But it's just again, it comes. I love the creative side of this industry, and that's where my passion lies for sure. But what is something that you're working on right now? We, we're working on several projects right now. Um, We've got a big festival we do in um, San Diego called Kaboo, K-A-A-B-O-O. It's a great festival. This is year three. Uh, that's coming up in September. So that's we've got that going on. And we've got uh, two Christmas tours we're working on and two other fall tours. We've got Judah and the Lion and St. Paul and the Broken Bones both going out here in, in August. And so it's busy, but I would say problem. Somebody asked me that recently as well, and my answer was the thing I, I struggle with the most personally and my big problem is, is – um, the keyword is balance. Um, and that's been my word for 2017 is balance. Um, I went through a pretty rough divorce last year, and I don't mind sharing that. That's fine. It, but out of that, I learned that it's about balance. And that's why you guys are sitting in my home today is because today's balance is I have a 10-year-old that needs his dad here, and it's his last week before school, and spending time with him is important to me. And uh, that means that we don't go, I don't go to the office when he's here. I mean, that's and I'm very blessed with the fact that Mark and Eric are holding things down, and I'm able to be a dad and hang out here and, and play Legos. And, uh, you know, I'm still working. I'm, I'm, I've got conference calls. I've got emails. But it's about him right now. And, and, and balance for me is, is several things. Balance to me is spending time with my son. It's spending time uh, on myself. It's, it's trying to, as a 44-year-old, keep my weight in check and make sure I'm eating right. It's about spending time with my parents. It's about spending time with my girlfriend. It's about making sure my two employees are having the best quality of life they can and they're getting what they need out of their careers. Um, it's about making sure my clients have what they need and that we're servicing our clients. Um, balance is my key word. So I don't want to call it a problem, but that's 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 where I'm at. It's all about making sure I'm in balance right now. And again, you have the right team of people around you. Um, balance is much easier, and uh, make you know hopefully make the right decisions and it keeps that wheel all the spokes in the wheel together and keeps it rolling. What would be some um, <coughs> advice that you would give to maybe people that are in your situation or that are touring that have a problem with balance, other than like finding a team that you can be open and honest and talk with and and for them to help you out um what would you recommend these people do to where they can get balance in their life you know it's to me my answer is list and priorities um it what really matters to you um for a a person in their early 20s who doesn't have a uh, maybe a child it's it's going to be different than than what matters to me um I would say one thought is I'm an admitted workaholic. I'm, I'm a workaholic. I don't watch TV. I don't watch movies. Um, I, I, I have a couple. I mean, I, I, again, I like to spend time with my family and my friends. And I love going to my, my gym and getting my workouts in. But I'm a workaholic. And I'm the guy that will work at 7 a.m. I'll be the guy that will still be working at 11 p.m. Don't, don't be like me. Uh, and I don't think I'm a bad person for being a workaholic. But it, it costs me a marriage. I mean, it cost me losing focus of what mattered and not i'm not saying the demise of my marriage was completely my fault i'm saying that things being out of balance i had a lot to do with it so i would say to somebody you know find out what matters and focus on that and 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 i physically write things down um uh, i'm a big list person i'm a big calendar person i'm very organized but on my bathroom mirrors i brush my teeth every day are my priorities and my goals and i read them every day to make sure I'm on track. I'm on track with where I want to be financially, physically, spiritually, as a parent, as a son, as a boyfriend, as a boss. I have goals, and um, and and just just keeping track of those and, and reminding myself of what matters to me. Yeah, I like that. Um, do you want? Do you have more questions to ask? Because um. <laughs> we can, but I think we're at a good spot. Yeah. I think, that's really I think we're good. Yeah. 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 Anything, um, any other things that you would like to bring up? Talk about? No, I mean, I think, I think what you guys are doing is great. I think, uh, I think it's important that, I mean, this is something, this is something we all know. And I think you and I talked about this the other day is records don't sell anymore. Um, and we all know that physical albums don't sell. And, 
with that, artists are having to support their income by whatever means necessary, you know, whatever means necessary touring and making money. And I think that because physical records aren't being sold, touring is huge right now. And it's been huge for, I mean, six, seven years. Um, and I don't think it's going anywhere. And I think this town uh, as a whole, uh, uh, the in- entertainment industry in this town, is starting to come to grips with, this is a very viable thing. Like, roadies aren't just guys that wear all black or girls that wear all black shirts that uh, have drug problems. And uh, you know what I'm saying? There's this connotation when people say roadie that you get in your head, and it comes from that 70s picture that we see. And it's not, man. I mean, you got we've got a very, very diverse uh, talent pool in town. People of all different backgrounds, races, sex, cultures, everything that are pursuing careers in live production, and it's amazing. And they're making a very viable career. I mean, we're talking, you know, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year and up, depending on your career path that people are doing. Um, and so, and that's again, that comes back to why the Touring Career Workshop exists. It's all viable now. It's not a game. It's not a joke. I take my career very, very seriously, and um, uh, I don't take it for granted because as somebody who didn't go to college, who was delivering um, steaks or pizzas or whatever you want to call it, this it means more to me than I can describe i'm very very grateful and thankful to be where i am and it's something i just don't take for granted well thanks so much for taking the time out of your your day with your son to to sit down with us and uh i definitely learned a lot and i hope our our listeners do as well yeah absolutely hey just a few more things before you take off first of all you can find links to everything we discussed in the show notes this episode was brought to you by our wonderful patrons If you want to learn more about becoming part of the Patreon family and how you can unlock behind the scenes content, you can find us at patreon.com forward slash inside music city. If you enjoy this episode, you can go to our Facebook page and let us know. You can comment on posts, pictures, videos, anything really. Our Facebook is inside music city. Be sure to give us a like. And finally, please, please, please forward this episode to someone you feel like would enjoy listening to or learning from our conversation today. And again, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. You're awesome.